Hello, I'm Rebecca Patterson, and I'd like to thank you for joining me for my talk on songs, language choice, and verbal art. Three things I would like to accomplish. First, I'd like to introduce kanji languages and the state of multilingualism in Nigeria's Middle Belt as the context that we'll be looking at language choice within. Second, I'd like to briefly discuss the concept of verbal art within the language documentation context. And then we'll observe the range of languages that occur within the songs of Tamaan speaking women. So first multilingualism in Nigeria. What I want to propose is first that multilingualism is an individualized multivarietal reality. That is no two people have the same competency in the multiple languages that are around them. According to McGill and Blanche, many kanji languages coexist with a dominant lingua franca, Hausa. Adults are fluent, but kanji languages remain vital. And this is somewhat comes across as an opposition to what we expect in terms of language endangerment, but they're in a kind of a stable multilingual state. But most kanji language speakers also speak other varieties. Within the blue circle, you can see the location of the kanji languages in the Western part of Nigeria. And individual speakers may have exposure to other languages besides Hausa. For example, English is used as the language of education. Arabic is used in some um, Muslim contexts. Um, and there is quite a bit of intermarriage between the community groups. Further, within each kanji language, there are multiple varieties We'll be looking at some examples from Tma'an later in the talk. Um, and Tma'an has at least seven varieties. So an Tma'an speaker may be born and raised in a fair speaking community, but then may marry outside of that group and marry someone who lives, who has grown up among the Roar speaking variety, for example. It's also the case that Tma'an speakers marry Chilela speakers. So Tama'an speaking men commonly marry Chilela speaking women. And I say commonly for a couple of reasons, but one of them is that two of the consultants that I worked with were Tama'an speaking language supporters, language champions, and they were married to Chilela speaking women. And in those cases, often the children speak the language of the mother. They speak Chilela. Um, so the children of these language language champions are speaking their wife's language and not their own. And the fathers tend to communicate in Hausa in English with their children or, or also speak Chilela with them. So then what is verbal art? Here are some examples of verbal art in Tma. And this is not an exhaustive list, but it's just some of the things that I've um, encountered. So there's songs that we'll be talking about in this, and it's often accompanied by dance, and it's often multiple people in small groups. The two songs that we'll listen to today uh, happen to be performed um, by individual, individual women. Um, there's also uh, in this category of verbal art um, is folk tales. Um, have many talking animal stories and creation narratives, and um, they can all they can also contain songs. I also have short anecdotal or joke stories. Um, they tend to be less than, less than a, few, a couple minutes. Um, there's also word games. There's at least one called Bitty Beat. Um, it's a call and response game. And you have to have a precise timing to, to succeed in that game. And this term verbal art, I'm using it in the sense that Finnegan um, tells us about was was used as a cover term by Bascom to cover ideas like folk tales, myths, legends, proverbs, riddles, and generally now it, it also includes songs and poems and things like um, naming ceremonies and tongue twisters. So why do we want to document verbal art? Well, verbal art, even in a in a robust language community where the language is still being used for certain functions, the verbal art may become extinct long before the language um, is endangered. 
So the next, the second, the coming generation may continue to learn the language, um, but they are not learning the art forms of their elders. Also documenting this verbal art is not just documenting the language, um, but also the cultural practices and the knowledge system that's bound up in it. There's um, quite a bit of research that's been done on um, Australian languages in this area. Songs also can provide evidence of language change and they can expose extensive multilingualism. And this may be interesting for our purposes here. There's also evidence that, that songs specifically can display grammatical and lexical phenomena that's not attested elsewhere in the language. And this can be a source of information about the language history um, as those forms may come from a previous state of the language, but it's also um, a, a place to be very cautious um, because I think, at least in the Atomatan case, there's, it's probably borrowings. Um, I've already mentioned culture and then songs can also be um, a ver very high on the list regarding community interest. So people in the community may want you to record their songs, for example, and then um, pass those songs back to them so that they can have evidence of their song and share it with other people in their community. But analyzing this verbal art also has its challenges. Um, there are technical challenges. For example, singing events or dancing events rarely happen with one performer near a microphone without other noise around. Um, so there's this idea from Lukey of documenting the situational context. And so if you get a recording of a song that accompanies a dance and you want the accompanying dance in the video, then you have to be careful and clever about how you record the audio from that same event. Also, there can be issues about the time of day when verbal art is performed. Um, some, in some communities, it only happens at nighttime. And so then you have some lighting issues to deal with. Methodologically, um, it's not always clear what you're recording or why you're recording it. I, I really like the, the piece by, by Childs and Good and Alice um, related to making a record of the language repertoire of a community. So in multilingual communities, the multiple languages are all woven together in life. <clears throat> They're not separated out. And um, if we're documenting the language used by a community, then it may, may slip over into other languages at times. And there's value in, in knowing that as well. Nicotina, a uh, presentation by Nicotina um, also mentioned ethical challenges partly related to the fact that, that these could be group gatherings and it's difficult sometimes to get con um, consent um, ideals taken care of when there's a large audience um, who, is also, who are also participating specifically in call and response in large dances. A further challenge <clears throat> is related to the content and understanding the lyrics, for example, because sometimes songs are sung in languages that the, that the speaker, that the singer doesn't even know. So let's take a look at some songs of it's my and speaking women. The languages that I've found among songs by Ama'in women or Tma'in speaking women <clears throat> include the varieties of Tma'in. So there's Utfer, Utkag, Utmakur, Utmajir, Utmaror, Us Us, and Utsuksun. Just one um, a comment about the name Tma'in. It's a, it's a cover term for these seven varieties and it's a construct that is um, not much older than um, the turn of the century. So it was about 2000 when Utma'in was suggested as a cover term for these groups. Um, they all have, <clears throat> they have clear identities, but they are mutually intelligible for the most part. Um, the second most common language found in songs in my data is Chilela. 
Tulela is a related language. It's a nearby language. And there is, as I mentioned before, quite a bit of intermarriage between those communities, between the Chilela speakers and Itmaan speakers. Hausa, the <clears throat> lingua franca from all of Northern Nigeria and Central Nigeria um, is also, also shows up in songs. Um, sometimes it's a word here and there, but um, often it can be an entire song in Hausa. And then um, Arabic has shown up in songs, um, mostly in phrases, greetings, et cetera. Um, I, I do want to mention that there is a 19, 8, 1994 study by um, Ango Penny on the culturally specific genres of songs in Chilela. And so there's a well-explored um, description of songs in Chilela. And the three categories break down roughly to um, songs of praise, songs of mockery, and songs of sorrow. The first song that we're going to hear is called um, You Are With, You Have Become With Me, um, is the translation, but not Shumene by Lema Mazi, who's the performer here. I don't know the composer, but uh, uh, Lema Mazi is the performer. And um, she identifies as fair, and the song is um, completely unfair. And I don't have a full transcription and translation of it. We're just going to listen to a piece of it. It was recorded in 2017. So we're going to hear a bit of dialogue leading up to the song. And um, Lema Mazi has just finished singing two other songs. And now she's, she's been asked for one more song before she leaves and has a bit of a struggle to think of one. And um, perhaps it's being put on the stop, perhaps spot perhaps it's being put on camera but she suggests um that she should sing a song in hausa um but tume who is there recording this suggests taking a minute to think and then um, this song comes to her and so she sings it Okay, so there's an example, and um, this was um, not well rehearsed, and it wasn't um, planned for. Um, and you can see some of the audience that was listening in on the song. And um, towards the end of the song, there's a lot more interaction between the people listening and Lema as she's singing. Next, um, we're going to look at a song that has been a bit of a puzzle. Um, this is within a story called the um, King's Okra or the Okra Field. And the performer is Mama Ilya. She's the storyteller. She also identifies as fair. And um, when transcribing this story, I was not able to work with Mama Ilya. She was in a different town. And so I was working with two um, Tamaror speakers, both women, who struggled with different parts of the story and um, laughed a lot, sometimes listening. And they kept saying, well, that must be how they say it in fair. Um, that's not how we say it. And then they would give me the phrase in roar. And often it was a difference in noun class. There's also um, a difference in the way that roar speakers would often say fair, for example, the name of the dialect fair, but a fair speaker alternates between where and fair. So they had um, a labialized um, H uh, for where roar has F. And so um, the song in this case is entirely contained within the speech of a particular character. And in this case, it's the okra um, that sings. 
and the song is repeated four times within this story. So parts of this repeated song were also unintelligible um, to the two Roar consultants. And the reaction to that was not about how it sounded, like that must be how it sounds unfair, but, but to very clearly say, this is not our language and we don't know what it means. Um, and so I said, well, what language is it? And they had no suggestions beyond saying, maybe it's fair and we just don't know it. Um, but to that point, most of the content of the story had been understandable to them. My best guess is that this is, the sections of these songs are from the neighboring language, Chilela, just partly because of the, how common Chilela is in the songs of women in general in the corpus. So um, let's take a look. I'll, I'll play different parts of it um, at different times. Um, so this, this is being analyzed in Ilan Corpa and um, the highlighted portion here is the singing, um, but we're going to hear the dialogue or, or the, the, the speech introductory um, phrase, which is then the okra said, and the translation of this entire thing is then the okra said, the king has sent me to catch the okra or the kumb um, to make soup for my in-laws. And then um, the second half of the song, I'm not quite sure what it means. I have some guesses, but here we go. Let's listen. <laughs> It was very fast, but we'll hear it again. So this is the portion that was understandable and you can see that the level of detail, for example, of all the morphemes and the ability to break it down into the grammatical pieces was not a problem. And um, some of this I know because I know other um, information about the language, but a lot of it was provided by my consultants. And those two Roar consultants could not give the same level of detail for the second half of the song. So here's the part that is Tmain, um, for sure, um, recognized by Utma Roar speakers and spoken by an fair speaker, spoken and sung. <laughs> And that's where the, the intelligible piece ends. And then as if we go um, and zoom in on the unintelligible piece, um, it may not be easy for you to tell from here, but um, there seems to be a repetition. So is it onomatopoeia? Is it idiophone? I don't know. Um, there were no guesses by my consultants or other consultants afterwards after that who had listened to it. Um, there's familiar roots in here um, to me. The, the root pus, if the, z, if the z here were an s, pus means white and it's in the right position to be an adjective and it has something on the end of it. So perhaps that is an agreement marker. And the root um, man, here, M-A, long A-N, is the root for in-law. And both of those, well, in-laws was in the previous part of the song. So there's a bit that I can analyze, um, but I haven't pulled it out because I'm not sure. I don't, I don't know what this is. Um, and we'll just listen to it one more time. <laughs> And it, it, it's, um, there, there's certainly some um, metricality to it. it it's, it's got a, an, an interesting melody that, is, that sticks in your head. And it's the part that incidentally that, that you <laughs> keep singing um, as you walk away. And um, my best guess is that this is Hausa, uh, not Hausa, that this is Chilela. Um, but it also doesn't match what I know about Chilela morphemes for these words. There is a Chilela dictionary. I can't find these words. I think white is the same root, so white is in both, but the, um, the root for um, in-laws is not the same. So 
I'm, I'm not, I'm not sure what's going on here. Um, the, so then, then I wonder, well, okay, is this an old form of one of the varieties of a Tama'in or something that was um, related to both a Tama'in and Shalela? And how old is this song? How new is this song? I'm not sure. These are unanswered questions. So as soon as I can get back to visiting Mama Ilya in, um, in Nigeria, I will be, be asking those questions. So um, one last comment, and then I'll, I will wrap up. This idea of language choice and song and narrative appears to be a phenomena across West Africa. So there's ongoing work um, within the project Discourse Reporting and African Storytelling at Lacan uh, near Paris. And um, some of the languages involved, um, sometimes the language is not intelligible to the audience at all, and it's a uh, mystery language. Sometimes um, the meaning of the words is not parsable by the storyteller, but they can give a general meaning. Sometimes the language is assumed to be an archaic form of the language. That's true for Man, uh, uh, Juan, a Mande language from Cote d'Ivoire. Um, sometimes the other language occurs within the speech of non-human characters. And so there's a great tendency for for non-humans like animals or plants, that when they speak, they speak in that other language. And there's also some patterns related to um, communities who have um, contact with some of these, these languages from their, their history. And so they assume they're that language, but when you compare that to the modern language, it doesn't match at all, but they, they claim that it is. So um, I'm looking forward to see what comes out of that study and the Itma and data will speak into that. But um, thanks for joining me today and for hearing just a bit about how songs are in Itma'in and um, the way language choice is available to Itma'in speakers when they sing songs. Um, the songs themselves have been composed in some language, but then they've been incorporated into stories as well um, partially interpretable as a Tma'in and partially not. So uh, we'll see what comes of the rest of the corpus. Thanks. I look forward to um, your questions and comments and insights um, during the Q&A of the conference. Thank you.